Well, I don't need to add much regarding uh, Lieutenant Colonel LaTondra, except to say she truly is an example of backed by popular demand. Uh, she has been here as a speaker at ethics conferences more than any other single individual, I think, in the last three years. And I think you'll see why as she leads you through this case. I got some feedback from colleagues that people were wondering, why are we going to talk about Don't Ask, Don't Tell? The policy has been changed. Aren't we done? Um, I think what uh, Linnell will clearly show you is uh, while the policy change is done, the challenges for you as leaders of organizations in terms of figuring out how to implement the policy is far from clear, uh, both as legal matter and as just general questions of ethical policy. So I think uh, what she'll do, I'm sure, is lead you through some hard cases and help you start to think about the very large range of questions you are going to deal with when you go back to your own commands. So without further ado, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Latondra. Professional responsibility versus personal convictions. We are going to talk today a little bit about don't ask, don't tell, but more importantly, I want us to answer these following questions. What do we do when we are faced with an issue where our military duty conflicts with our personal beliefs? Or our people's duty conflicts with their own? Is it possible for us to separate our professional obligations from our personal opinions? And should we as officers have to do so? And finally, what happens if those personal opinions are grounded and rooted in our moral or religious fiber? Those are tough questions. Don't Ask, Don't Tell is just a platform to take a look at them. But those are the questions that I want us to focus on here today. And I don't know if Martin mentioned how we actually met. We met at the Air Force Academy, and at root, I'm a teacher, which means that you all get to answer questions, um, especially those who love to sit in the back of the room. Um, so today, we'll be going through some hypos, both in, throughout the presentation and then at the end. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts as, as we go through this here today. So it's October of last year and I have the audacity to get off the stage too to talk to you guys. It's October of last year. Where are my Submariners? Raise them high, where, well, proud. Oh, there's some in the back too, all oh, my favorites. All right, raise them high in the back. It's October of 2011. You are a, you're, this is your boat, I've learned that's a boat. Um, and you're about to get underway. And somebody comes to you and says, Captain, I'm not doing it. Are you kidding? These are small quarters. I'm not going. That was not the policy when I signed up. When I signed up, women had no business on a boat. I'm not going. What do you say, Captain? Where's my sub guy? What do you say? This is Lieutenant Commander Jess Porter. I'm a Navy submariner. You say, like the uh, general said yesterday, we don't we don't fly an air a uh, airline. So it's your job. We're getting underway. It's your job. You're getting underway. But come on. When I signed up, this was different. I shouldn't have to work with them. Is this a new problem? Not really. And if you think that the Navy is, is, has a new problem um, with having integration of, of subs, um, think again, because the Air Force integrated these missile silos back in the late 90s. And unfortunately, the first commander to face that question when he had a, a young captain who came up and said, it's against my religious beliefs to be confined with a woman underground for 24 hours at a time. He did. And the captain's response, or the commander's response at the time, was not suck it up and go do it. It was, well, I'll rearrange your schedule. The next commander came in and said, no way, no how. And this is, it's not quite as tight as the submarine. You know, we're at the Air Force. We've got to have a little cushion. Um, the next commander who came in said, that's unacceptable and ordered him to go underground on his assigned missile silo watch. He refused, and he was Article 15. But I'm not here today to talk to you about gender integration issues, nor to make the case that they are some sort of perfect analogy uh, to, the, to the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. 
while there may be some similarities, there are a lot of differences. Today, though, I want to use Don't Ask, Don't Tell and analyze leaders and what they did during this repeal and study for us to take a look at and to question ourselves and look at the difficult questions of what we do when our professional responsibilities conflict with our personal beliefs, especially if those beliefs are grounded in some sort of religious fiber. To do that, we're first gonna understand our oath of office. Read it, take a look at it, understand some of the, what the Supreme Court has said about it. And then we're going to take a look at the, as I said, the oath in the context of don't ask, don't tell, repeal. And then you get to put your oath into practice. We'll go through some more scenarios. So where are my Marines? Okay, this is an advanced warning because I understand that you need some more time. I'm coming to you next. So. I'm just kidding, I love you guys. Uh, although the most terrifying moment of my time on Don't Ask, Don't Tell was not when I had to report to go work as the legal advisor for the Four Star. It was when I had to brief the Marine Commandant and the, both the outgoing and the incoming about their survey results. That was the most terrifying moment of my entire career. So, but I survived. So this is your oath. When's the last time you read it? You've all taken it. In fact, I bet all of you have even given it commissionings, promotions, but when's the last time you read it? What does it mean? What have you signed up to do? Because it tells us a lot. It tells us that we're not here, quite frankly, to defend our country. You never swore to defend your country in this oath. You're swearing to defend this. Have you read this? It's your constitution, and this is what you have sworn to give your life for. To protect it against enemies, both foreign and domestic. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about what the Supreme Court says that obligation means. You have uh, sworn to bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And what that means is that your rights get trumped by this. Now that does not mean that you don't get any of the protections. There, there's a couple. Uh, you get more protections now than you did as a MIDI, um, if you're a Naval Academy grad. Uh, but we don't get all of these. And the Supreme Court has gone through and talked about what rights we receive as officers and as members of the military and which ones we agree to do away with by raising our hand to protect this. So let's take a look and see what protections were afforded and which ones were not. Uh, where are my doctors in the house? I promise I'm not actually calling on you. So just any docs, no medics whatsoever. One, I apologize up front. Most of the Supreme Court cases dealing with what an oath means or does not mean come from doctors doing bad things. So let's get started. All right. The first one is a very famous case called Orloff versus Willoughby. And there was a doctor who was educated by the army. And he was coming in um, ready to, to be commissioned as an officer and to serve as a doctor. And he was told that he would have to swear that he was not a communist. Swear that he would have no allegiances whatsoever to the communist party. And he said, no, I'm not gonna do that. And so the army said, well, fine. Uh, you're not going to be commissioned, but you're not getting out of your commitment either. You are going to be a medic. Most educated blood drawer in the United States Army. No commission for you. And the, he sued the army. I'm entitled to my commission. And the Supreme Court said, no. You are not entitled to a commission. In fact, the Supreme Court said that the very essence of military service is the subordination of individual desires and the interest of the individual to the needs of the service. Breaking that down for you, that essentially means that the service needs trump your individual rights, your individual desires. We all know that, right? Service before self. Well, we didn't need the Supreme Court to tell us that. Well, there was another case, 
this one happened in involving free speech and, and Vietnam. Again, another army doctor um, in Parker versus Levy. Uh, the army doctor was telling his patients um, that he would tell special operators that they were baby killers and thieves. He would look at African-American soldiers and, and tell them, don't you dare go over there to Vietnam. They're specifically drafting you. You shouldn't go. You should uprise and say, hey, I'm not going. And he was prosecuted and convicted. And he said, wait a minute. I've got free speech rights. I should have the ability to say what I want to say when I want to say it. And the Supreme Court said, no, actually, you don't. You do not have the same free speech rights as a person walking around in civilian clothes in downtown Newport. In fact, they said that the rights of men in the armed forces must pre-force be conditioned to meet certain overriding demands of discipline and duty. That's some really fancy Supreme Court language. So where are my spades players? No one. Wow, that's how I got through the Air Force Academy, just playing spades. Okay, that means that discipline and duty trump rights. Discipline and duty trump your rights to free speech. Well, the Supreme Court had a, yet another case, and, and this one has less to do with individual constitutional rights and more to do with this idea of civil-military relationship. There was in the ability of the military to limit political leaflets on Fort Dix. Um, these leaflets had to do uh, with an upcoming campaign. And the question came, at what point can the military res further restrict speech? on its bases, on its installations, and perhaps restrict speech of others, not just the military. And the Supreme Court talked about this relationship between the civil and military and how important it was for the military to protect civilian control and to assert that we were in control by civil authorities. And they went on to say, that military policies must be both in reality and in appearance. They must be insulated from looking like they're for partisan political causes. So the moral of Greer versus Spock is that we in the military cannot be or appear to be partisan. And the final case, and I promise we won't turn you into lawyers by the end of the day. This is your final case, Goldman versus Weinberger. And this, we're coming back to the docs. This time I'm gonna pick on Air Force docs. And we had an Air Force doc who wore a yarmulke. And he was told to take it off and said no. Uh, and was prosecuted uh, for, for failing to obey an order. And he took this case all the way up to the Supreme Court and said, wait a minute, this is my religious beliefs. How can you tell me that I can't wear an article of religious clothing. And the Supreme Court came back and actually said the following, that the military need not encourage debate nor tolerate protest. And to the extent that such tolerance is required, um, that the military got to have a huge say-so in that. They actually, so in other words, the military does not need to be a debate club. They went on to hold that the First Amendment does not require the military to accommodate religious practices in the face of military views that such practices distract from uniformity. Now, wait a minute, I know you're gonna ask me in Q&A, but, but I've seen officers, I've seen enlisted members who, are, who wear yarmulkes, not in the Marines, but in the Navy and in the Air Force and in the Army. So why is that? Well, because Congress gets to come back and trump the Supreme Court, and they actually passed a law stating that the services could not restrict that from occurring, as long as you could wear a hat over it. So, these are the principles um, here on the bottom that we are, help define our oath, but now we're gonna put it into practice. So, you're a senior leader. Hey, by that I mean you're a three or a four star, and I know we have at least a couple of you sitting out here that this is going to apply to. You're a senior leader, and it is January of 2010, and as any good senior leader does, they are listening to their, their POTUS, their commander-in-chief given the State of the Union address, and you hear the following, that this year, in 2010, 
The president said, we are going to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Not four days later, our Secretary of Defense, before the Senate Armed Service Committee, says that it is not a question of whether, it is a question of how. Then our chairman gets up and says that, for me personally, this is a matter of integrity. And again states that he personally believes that Don't Ask, Don't Tell should be repealed. Well, you've watched all of this, and then you get a phone call. I got a phone call. I actually happened to have been sitting right down here um, when I got this phone call. I got called away. The three-star wanted me. I was a major at the time. And he comes up and he's and over the phone, Linnell, they want you to go be the scribe. They want you to be the legal advisor for the don't ask, don't tell. So what do you say? And the answer, of course, is, well, yes, sir, of course I'll do it. I will say that that was not nearly as nerve-wracking of a phone call that this man received. He got the phone call a little bit earlier than I did. Okay, and his phone call went something like this. General Ham, we want you to lead the comprehensive review working group to analyze whether or not Don't Ask, Don't Tell, with how the military would respond and whether or not we could do it. His response? I must admit to you that when Secretary Gates appointed me as co-chair of this review, I was not all that thrilled. General Ham has been called the most plain-spoken four-star that we currently have, and, and you will see why as we talk about him today. He went on to say, I anticipated the task would be complex, tough, sometimes unpleasant and uncomfortable, and I now must acknowledge that I underestimated these factors. <laughs> the pressure on him at that point in time was immense. The complexity that he had to deal with, and, and I've talked to him, by the way, uh, before talking with you, and he, as a graduate of this fine Naval War College, he, of course, wanted me to, to assure that I, it was just fine that I talked about him before you all. Um, but the complexity arose in two different ways. Uh, one, with respect to, in looking at these obligations that our oath puts on us, the complexity arose both with respect to professional responsibilities as well as personal convictions, and then how the two collide. And so I'd, I'd like to tease those apart a little bit. I, I think it's easy for us to grasp how these issues uh, that our oath talks about might conflict here. We, we get that, that some people have, had, have, it's tough for them to balance their personal convictions against this, these oath issues. The more interesting, one of the interesting ones, and I'll just touch on a little bit here is, what about professional responsibilities? Because the terms of reference that were laid out by Secretary of, of Defense um, Gates were challenging. And they were challenging to make sure that we were doing okay with our oath obligations, even though we were given a job to do. And let me talk about that, because this is what we were asked to do. We were asked to systematically engage the force. We interviewed and surveyed 400,000 members of the armed forces, forces, one of the largest surveys to ever occur. We surveyed 150,000 spouses. That had never occurred to that degree. We had an online inbox where anybody could tell us what they thought, and 72,000 of you did. And yes, we read every single entry. We had over 140 small group sessions, 95 information exchange forums that looked kind of like this group, uh, to talk about this issue, this huge systematic engagement of the force. We also were told that we had to recommend changes. So if it gets repealed, what are you going to do? What's the plan? How are you going to roll it out? What sort of training do you need? What sort of new policies would re be required? And then the real kicker, was to actually review and assess the impact to the military with a repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And the question became, how do you balance what the secretary has asked us to do with these? Because I will tell you that there were groups on both 
the right and the left that were telling us no matter what choice we made, we were going against what we were supposed to do. Uh, on one hand, you had a, a group of individuals, uh, namely Congress, uh, who would say, what are you doing reviewing and assessing what a repeal in the law would look like? We told you what the impact would be to the military. Not only that, we put it into law. There were 14 different factors back when 10 U.S.C. 654 was initially put into play. They were the law about what the impact would be on the military. And here we are trying to reassess that. On the other hand, and on the other side of the aisle, you had people saying, what do you mean you're going to ask the military what they think? Since when do you float personnel policies by the majority of the service? The military, remember, need not be a debate club. Those are tough. So how did we balance those issues, those responsibilities that we have on the right with, with what we were told to go do by Secretary Gates? Well, for starters, we were pretty transparent about the way in which we were conducting this analysis. We were told, go out, and if Congress decides to change the law, how are we as the military going to handle it? It was kind of like a war plan. If this contingency happens, what are you going to do? And to do that, we had to understand from members of the service what they thought would happen, where the risk and hot points were, what policies needed to be changed. But balancing those, especially in the context of our oath, was challenging at times and was critiqued at almost every turn. And we can talk a little bit more about those, how those oath obligations can sometimes even impact what you're told to do on the professional side of the house. But today, I would like mostly to discuss the tougher issue. And that is, what do you do when your personal convictions collide with your professional responsibilities? Now, I told you I had General Han's permission to talk here. General Ham had personal, deeply rooted beliefs about this issue. He was a Jesuit, educated individual, but more importantly, General Ham recognized what his oath and his obligations were. And he also recognized that he might not be the only person that was facing these personal convictions versus professional responsibilities. So when he first pulled this all together, he made it really clear the first thing he said to this small group was rule number one, check your personal beliefs at the door. He said, I will not ask you what your personal opinion is. I don't want to hear what your personal opinion is. And he said, and if you cannot follow this rule, get up and walk out. We're all sitting in the secretary's conference room. It was a really nice, cushy place, and uh, nobody moved. Um, so everybody did it. Everybody checked their personal opinions at the door. And at the end of the day, Prof General Ham came to and gave a pro his professional a belief and opinion. But let me talk to you a little bit more about the other things that he did with respect to his personal opinion. He gave me a job. So I was his legal advisor, and he called me in for my first assignment. And it went something like this. Linnell, I signed a piece of paper at some point, and it told when I had to give my personal beliefs to Congress. Can you figure out when that is? So for all of you who are going to be a three and four star, listen up, OK? You're going to get a piece of paper before you're confirmed. And it reads something like this. When required, when called to do so before a duly constituted committee of Congress, you shall give your personal opinion. So I marched back into him and said, here's your paper, sir. The only time you have to give your personal opinion is before a duly constituted uh, committee uh, before Congress. Got it, Linnell. Okay. Then we'd go over to Congress and we'd meet with a couple senators, you know, in their office and, and he'd be like, is this one of those? No, sir, you're good. Don't have to answer their questions. <laughs> and every, then we had some like informal meeting, but it wasn't a real duly constituted committee, is, but it looked like one. Is this one? No, sir, you're okay. 
And I never, so this came, this opinion, this was his professional judgment. This report was issued on November 30th of 2010. And this is what General Ham said, along with Mr. J. Johnson, who was the DOD general counsel. Based on all we saw and heard, our assessment is that when coupled with all these recommendations and policy changes, the risk of repeal of don't ask, don't tell to overall military effectiveness is low. That got released the morning of November 30th, 2010. We then walked over, walked over, we were driven over to the Hill before the House Armed Services Committee. Guess what this is? A duly constituted committee of Congress. And they have all read this. They all got their own personal copies and they've seen this, this professional statement about that he, General Ham, believes the risk to the military is low, that we can do this. And they start at the top um, of, of Hask and they, with all the senior uh, representatives and they work their way down and they finally get to some young, brand new representative, um, uh, Democrat, and he, he gets to the mic and he says, General Ham, what's your personal belief about don't ask, don't tell? And he gave it. And you could have heard a pin drop. It is the first and only time that I have ever heard General Ham say what his personal beliefs are. The man next to him about fell over. Okay, the man next to him was Mr. J. Johnson, a political appointed general counsel. He said, when it went over to him for his response to the question, I've never heard what General Ham's professional or personal opinion was. And I've been with this man for the last 10 months traveling. Like they even had Thanksgiving together over in Germany by, while the rest of us were working on the report. Um, we then got in a car. <laughs> Okay. We then got in a car, we went back over the Potomac, and we went into this room. This is the media room um, in, the, in the first floor of the Pentagon. And mind you, this committee that was called, this Hask Committee, it was a closed door committee hearing. Closed door, meaning no media allowed, meaning none of the uh, individuals, none of the staffers could say what was said um, in, that, in that meeting. And so not 45 minutes later, we've been whisked over, we're back in this room, and a reporter says, so General Ham, I understand you have a personal opinion about don't ask, don't tell. Oh no, here it comes. And he says, when called before a duly constituted <laughs> committee before Congress, I gave my personal opinion. That's the polite four-star way of saying, shut up and color. Uh, and then Mr. Johnson piped up, and that's when he explained that he'd never, ever heard that opinion before. I, of course, was as a legal advisor, was sitting right over here going, yeah, he listened. It was great. So December 2nd, he's called before SASC. This is, this is a public hearing, and, and Senator McCain asked him, do you, a slightly different question. He asked him both his personal and his professional judgment about whether or not we could do this. And this was General Ham's response. After nine months of study, I am convinced that if the law changes, the United States military can do this even in a time of war. I am here today to tell you that General Ham's ability to separate his personal convictions from his professional obligations is a model. It is a model to us all. And I would like, though, to compare, because not everyone has done this. So let's take a look. This is General Mixon. Um, at the time, he was, this is a two-star picture, but he was a, a three-star. He wrote an op-ed um, in Stars and Stripes. He was over in the Pacific, and he says, wondering what to do to stop this ill-advised repeal of a policy? If those of us who are in favor of retaining the current policy do not speak up, there is no chance. He was rebuked publicly by the chairman. The secretary told him he should resign. He did not. So, what's the difference? How can we have a chairman who is lauded for giving his personal beliefs before Congress and the world? We can have a general 
who gets publicly rebuked for doing the same. And you got the guy in the middle who stays quiet. What's the difference? I'm a teacher trained to wait through silence. Should he have been rebuked? Is it just because the guy on the right wears a really great looking uniform? Personal opinion's fine as long as it's the party line. And we heard a bunch of that. It's okay as long as it doesn't go against the flow. Is that why? What's different about what General Nixon did? Is it just that he didn't toe the party line? Context, why? Stand up, be proud. What else did General Nixon do? Here, let's go back. What did he do? What else is different about what he said? He asked, he talked to who? I heard it. He called his subordinates out. He said, hey, come with me. If you don't like this, we know how to fix it. And I think that is very different from what Admiral Mullen did. Admiral Mullen talked about for me and me alone. And if you go back and you can parse every statement he ever made, he talked about my personal beliefs. He didn't call out for others to do the same. And I think that really and dives into the issue about what it means to be, have an oath and a personal responsibility that do we use our position, our position to try to drag others into our personal beliefs? That, I believe, is where General Nixon went awry. That he used his position to try to promote his personal convictions, not only for himself, but to have others come along with him. Another model that I think we can all follow is General Amos, a person who did not tow the party line. However, he is a model for how you cannot tow the party line and yet be consistent with your obligations as an officer and consistent with your oath. General Amos was asked before a congressional committee, should we do this and could we do this. He was asked both for his personal and his professional judgment. And he came back and he said, no, we should not do this. That in his professional and personal opinion, the risk was too great. He then went on to say, but we can. That if you ask us to do this, and I quote, we will get in step and do it smartly. And then he put his money where his mouth was because he was the first joint service chief to step up and make a statement after repeal. The first one. And he said, Marines can do this and we will do this. And then he put his money where his mouth was and he coughed up a two-star general to lead the repeal effort. So the analysis has taken place, the working group's all done. Well, now we have an implementation team and from what I understand, two stars are not easy to come by in the Marine Corps, unlike the Air Force, where you can shake a stick and you can get a GO, okay? Um, the Marines coughed up a two star to lead this effort. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a leader who knows how to separate those professional obligations and knows when to explain what he personally believes, what he professionally believes, how to dissent in public. And then, when called to do so, step up and do it smartly like only a Marine can. Now it is not always easy. I'm not saying that this is easy. 
to separate your personal convictions from your professional responsibilities, but you are going to be called to do it if you haven't already. And I will tell you that regardless of where you stand on the issue of don't ask, don't tell, you are going to be called and challenged on your personal convictions. I don't care what you believe about the repeal personally. This implementation is going to challenge you. And so let's walk through just how. All right, the United States Navy comes out and says that they will allow same-sex marriages to take place in military chapels to include the Naval Academy's own chapel. There's an uproar. And then they flip-flopped. They raced to retract it. Okay. Which one's right? Follow the law. What law? Defense of Marriage Act. We've got budding lawyers in here. All right. Well, what Defense of Marriage Act? We don't have a Defense of Marriage Act anymore, do we? The president's made his opinion known. Um, over a year ago, he said that his administration was no longer going to defend the constitutionality of defense of marriage. It's in the courts. That's correct. Do we have to follow DOMA? Yes, it's the law. Okay. So what is DOMA? What does it mean? Does DOMA prevent us from having marriages and chapels? Where are my lawyers? I know I've got at least one. Federal it's federal property. Okay, it's federal property. So DOMA means what? Okay, so it has to do with jurisdiction. It's a federal property. We've got jurisdiction. So DOMA means what? You can't have a marriage there, a same-sex marriage? What is DOMA? Well, this is the long version of DOMA. Okay. There's two parts, actually. The part we're interested in is here, um, the, and it has to do with what ma defining marriage, defining spouse. The other part has to do with recognition of states, um, and that states don't have to recognize. That's in a different part of the U.S. Code. We're not talking about that one. This is DOMA. DOMA is Webster's. Okay? If I am looking up a law or a regulation, and it uses the word spouse, marriage, husband, wife, I go to DOMA, and DOMA tells me what that means. And DOMA means that for any federal law or federal regulation, that anytime you use one of those words, it means that it has to be a man and a woman. So, walk me back to the chapel example. Now that you know you have your handy Webster's Dictionary, how does that apply or not? Who got married in the Naval Academy Chapel? I know there's got to be at least one of you. Nobody? Well, believe it or not, when you ask to use the chapel, you're not contracting for marriage. You're asking to borrow a building. And in that building, it's your ceremony. And believe it or not, when you went and you pulled out the chapel rules and the regs, they don't necessarily use words. They just say, hey, I want to use this building for a ceremony. Guess what? I don't have marriage. DOMA doesn't apply. And OSD PNR said essentially that same thing. OSD and R, uh, Dr. Stanley came out and said that for ch chaplains and chapels, that as long as the ceremony is legal in the state in which it's occurring, that chapel can be used for that purpose. Now, there is currently an amendment before the NDAA um, to undo that, but it has not passed. And so right now, DOMA does not prohibit chapels or chaplains from having or officiating over same-sex marriages. Can I force a chaplain to do it? Chaplain, you will give officiate over the same-sex marriage. No, why? Good. Bingo. Beautiful. Well said. That is exactly right. I can't force a chaplain to do this. Okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about chaplain issues later. All right, Marines, you've had lots of warning. 
you are a deployed commander in Afghanistan. And you've got a Lance Corporal who comes up to you and he is distraught because he learned that his husband was just diagnosed with terminal brain cancer and he has two months to live. He's got five months left on his deployment. Can you send him home? Where are my Marines? Can you send him home? I know there was a whole block of you all together. Can you send him home? Yes, why? Ah, all right, well, I'm in charge of my Air Force assets. Guess what? You're not getting a person on my plane unless they're on emergency leave. I've got really tight spaces. You find a way. You find a way. Good. So you find a way. Can you put them on emergency leave? Here is the famous answer that your JAGs give you all the time. Are you ready? It depends. Yeah, you've gotten it too. It depends. All right, because under the DODI, there's wiggle room. Look at the DOD. I've got involving members of their household, immediate family. Oh, wait a minute. Let's go back to my Webster's Dictionary, my DOMA Dictionary. Does DOMA define family? No. DOMA defined husband, wife, marriage. Guess what? DOMA doesn't control the DODI. I can give them emergency leave if you're in the Marines. If you wear this uniform, you can't. Because in the Air Force, we don't do this whole members of your household thing. We only do immediate family members. And immediate family members has a definition, and it goes like this. An immediate family member is a spouse, parent, child, sibling, sole surviving blood relative, or in loco parentis, meaning a parent. Guess what I don't get to do in the Air Force? My airman who comes up to me with the same problem, I don't get to give him emergency leave. So I do what? Adopt him. Adopt him. Yeah. <laughs> or I find a way. And that's what I've been told by Air Force commanders. We'll all find a way. And sometimes we can, and sometimes we can't. Can I change this Air Force regulation? Yes, I can't personally, but the Air Force can. We have not. All right, the other scenario, going back to my Navy brethren. So I've got uh, Lieutenant Commander O'Connell, has got a biological child, who wants to reside in on-base housing. Can she do it? Can she reside in on-base housing if she has a child? Yes, she wants to reside there with her girlfriend. Oh, I hear yes, I hear no. Yes, why? Ah, it's all privatized. Oh, that's a real kink. All right, we have 95% privatized housing. Let's talk to me about the 5% and then we'll go back to privatized. She's not a dependent. Well, she's her wife. Is she a dependent? What do I have to know? Okay, so primary caregivers can stay. Okay, go back to this. Is the wife of a female active duty member a dependent? How do you know? Depends on the state. Well, we don't define dependence in states. We define dependence in the military by federal law. So what do you need to know? You need to know how we define dependent and what word do we use. Okay, you have to, this is a full-time employment act for your lawyers, okay? <laughs> because we have to go and find out how do we define dependent and is there a word like wife? Is there a word like spouse or marriage? Okay, well guess how we, def well let's do another one and then we'll get back to the rules. Now, Lieutenant Keller and her biological child want to reside on Han Base housing with her boyfriend, Mark. Not married, just boyfriend, okay? Have to get approval, good, from whom? From the housing office or the, or the base, the base commander, installation commander, okay? Well, this is interesting. Can we treat them differently? No, and that has something to do with not just DOMA, but something we call the Equal Protection Act. 
or not act, but the equal protection, it's part, it's part of our constitution. We can't treat similarly situated individuals like this differently. And what the services found out is that we answer this question differently in the services. The Navy routinely, I think because of the whole ships going out of port, et cetera, routinely authorizes the boyfriend or the girlfriend to stay in on-base housing. So long before the issue of don't ask, don't tell arose, the Navy and actually the Army were, were routinely authorizing non-married couples to stay in base housing. Where are my Air Force guys? Do we? No. The Air Force does not, period. So guess what? The Navy and the Army had already answered number one decades ago. Because the moment they allowed a non-married individual to stay in on-base housing, they had answered it for the same-sex couple as well. The service chiefs weren't real happy about that. Um, what if there was no child dependent? They don't get base housing unless, where's my privatized guy? Unless we've got privatized housing. And then guess what? We've been able to have same-sex couples on military installations for years. Why? Because there's a waterfall chart. And if the military doesn't fill it, then I go to retirees and I go to civil service. If I go down to a base that we have at Robbins Air Force Base, Georgia, we have random civilians who are filling our military privatized housing because we have fallen down the waterfall chart. Do I get to put a requirement about what your sexual orientation is before you live in non-base ho privatized housing? Nope. These are tough, tough questions. Things that you're gonna need to find out, talking to your JAG, is this privatized, is it not? What's been our, our course of action with respect to other non-married partners residing in base housing or not? What if they're dual mill? Yet another complicating factor. What's fascinating about the housing rules, actually, is the housing rules in statute don't use the word spouse and don't use the word marriage. They call it military family housing. And as we've already discussed, DOMA doesn't define the word family. It's still an unresolved issue, and I was actually just about a month ago back in Mr. Johnson's office trying to grapple through some more issues re regarding our regulations um, and how we define um, issues and how this issue is going to play out. All right, another issue, another scenario. You have just attended a base chapel service, and the chaplain preached that homosexuality is an abomination. That chaplain is your unit chaplain and there's an openly gay sailor in your unit. Can you prohibit the chaplain from giving that sermon? What do you mean I can't prohibit him? Why not? You're right. So who said no nice and loud? Why can't I? Absolutely. We have statutory protections about our chaplains being able to perform ministry. Not only that, we have, you know that little book I had up there? The Constitution? Okay. A chaplain's free exercise is at its height inside the chapel. Okay. A chapel, a minister of faith inside the actual religious building, doing an actual religious thing, in other words, conducting a service or a ceremony, at its apogee. You can't say boo to that chaplain about what he or she says in that sermon. Can you request a different unit chaplain? I see heads, should you? How else could we handle this? This is just leadership issue, how else could we handle it? Talk to them. Wow, we could resolve a lot of things. Make them aware. Hey, chaplain, understand that's your personal view. When you're in this unit, just so you know, we've got a gay soldier, we've got a gay sailor. 
and I want that sailor to be a productive member of my unit. An accident occurs on deck. You're out to sea. The young sailor's killed. Can you limit what the chaplain says at the actual unit memorial service? Yes. yes. Why? Okay, either that, I don't have him officiate. <laughs> what else could I do? It's a command function. I could lay down some laws. Hey, chaplain, okay, you can come and talk, but it better be an inclusive talk. If you, can I force him to do that? Can I force him to give the speech? No, it's his option. But he, you can lay down requirements about if you want to speak at this unit's memorial service that is a unit function, not the one over in the chapel, the one that we're having right here on deck, you can lay down requirements. If the chaplain can't do that or doesn't care to or it goes against his or her religious tenet, that's okay. The chaplain can bow out. This is not a made-up scenario. When I was doing and working in the CRWG, I had a naval officer who came to me who said, this happened, except the chaplain did get up and speak. And the chaplain said that that sailor was going to hell because he was gay. Can you discipline the chaplain? I'm sorry? Can you discipline the chaplain? I, I think so. And that chaplain was, got some sort of paperwork. And I think that's OK. We are not at the, at the apogee of where that chaplain, that chaplain was not speaking in the church. That chaplain, as we talked, was in a unit ceremony, a unit memorial service. And I think it is OK to have different expectations there and to hold that chaplain accountable for saying something that corrodes the good order and discipline within that unit. But this is tough. This idea of one's religious rights and one's obligations is tough. Now, I will say that I got to talk to a lot of chaplains in 2010, uh, and they get this. I would say that Navy chaplain is a minority. Um, Chaplains get this. As, as one chaplain uh, uh, explained it to me, he said, man, you know, I work with people I think are sinners every day. <laughs> and think about it. We in the military, our chaplains understand that they have this sort of dual role. They have to minister to their flock in the way in which they are called to do so. But on the other hand, they're to minister to all and to help facilitate everyone's freedom of religion. I think we are probably one of the only places in the world where you could have a Jewish rabbi have a young sailor come up to him and say, Rabbi, where's the Ash Wednesday service? I don't know where it is. And the rabbi would take him over. What an amazing place we live in that we are able to, on a daily basis, separate our professional obligations from our personal convictions. And I don't think Don't Ask, Don't Tell is any different than the tough issues we faced before. It just puts it in a slightly different manner. Now I'm gonna go through a, a short conclusion and, and then open it up for questions. But I truly believe that there is going to come a time where you are each going to face the challenge of having conflicts between your professional responsibilities and your personal convictions. And you have to ask yourself, am I going to have the courage to do the right thing? In the late 1940s, there was a bill, a bill that was coming through the Senate it said that white officers could decline to command a unit of mixed race. It almost passed. There was one vote that separated that from passage. And that vote was, put, was made by the young Lyndon B. Johnson. 
lest you think that that is some sort of old issue, last year the House passed a similar amendment that our individuals, our military members, could make a personal choice about whether or not they served alongside, slept alongside individuals of a different sexual orientation. That law did not pass the Senate and is not law today. Two weeks ago, the House passed yet another amendment to the NDAA number thir uh, fiscal year 13. And it was slightly different, but had very similar connotations. This is not an issue that is just something from our ancient past where we have this idea of personal convictions versus professional responsibilities. And I'd like to walk through and take a look and compare some, some quotes. One from General Ham. I do not underestimate the challenges in implementing a law implementing a change in the law, but neither do I underestimate the ability of our extraordinarily dedicated servicemen and women to adapt to such change and continue to provide our nation with the military capability to accomplish any mission. We have to hold our sailors, airmen, marines, and soldiers to that standard of professional obligations, that they understand that they are putting aside their personal convictions for the greater good because they are taking an oath to this, not to their personal religious beliefs, not to their personal moral code, to this. History is going to remember if we do something different. If it were a question of having a Marine Corps of 5,000 whites or 250,000 Negroes, I would rather have the whites. The purpose of West Point is to train combat officers, and women are not, not able to lead in combat. Maybe you could find one, one in 10,000 who could lead in combat, but she would be a freak. And we're not running a military academy for freaks. <laughs> the superintendent, who was then asked to leave West Point when women came. History is going to remember what we say, whether it's comments like that or comments like this. The Marine Commandant, upon integration of the Marines, Negro Marines are no longer on trial. They are Marines, period. That's similar to the current Commandant's statement that a Marine is a Marine is a Marine. I hope today you've seen that the model that I believe epitomizes this idea of professional obligations versus personal convictions. We've got lots of leaders like that. But General Ham was one who, who struck upon me the importance and the recognition that when senior, that senior leaders can and are expected to separate the two, and so will you. And I hope that I can answer whatever questions that you may have in our remaining time. And we've got plenty of it. <laughs>